But at the end of the day, it's sometimes hard to predict how great a hire someone's gonna be, which is why it makes sense for us to hire people we already know are good fits. Welcome to the Next Gen Metal Fab Podcast. I'm your host, Tim Heston. In each episode, my co-host, Oshkut's Caleb Chamberlain, and I will bring you conversations about what the future could look like for precision sheet metal and tube fabrication. If you're involved in the pipe and tube industry, you won't want to miss the Pipe and Tube Conference this November in Omaha, Nebraska. This event is an excellent opportunity to connect with industry experts, stay up to date with the latest technologies, and explore new business opportunities. You'll leave the conference with a wealth of knowledge and new connections to help your business succeed. So mark your calendar for November 13th and 14th and join us in Omaha for the Pipe and Tube Conference. Register today at fmamfg.org. And now, back to the episode. Hello, this is Tim Heston, and welcome to the Next Gen Metal Fab podcast from the Fabricator Magazine and the Fabricator Podcast Network. I'm joined again by with Caleb, uh, by Caleb Chamberlain. Caleb, how are you doing today? Good. How are you, Tim? Oh, just grand and glorious for prepping for Fabtech and a busy time approaching. Um, but yeah, today I think we're going to, we're going to start talking about kind of a ubiquitous problem that people have across this industry, uh, specifically, you know, even during, you know, uptimes and downtimes and every time in between, and that's hiring employees and just kind of want to dig into, uh, Caleb's story about how he's hired folks from, from, you know, the very, you know, very beginning, uh, to where, where he's gotten to today. So, so Caleb, kind of just bring me through that story of, of you know, back in 2017 and 18 when you were just launching Oshkut. Um, how did you hire your first employee? Just kind of bring me through that story. Mm, well, initial employees, uh, I mean, we were a two-person shop, me and my brother. Uh, initial employees were just people we happen to know that we know are good workers, and that's great. So uh, the real question is, as you scale up, how do you find qualified people when maybe there's not enough in-network stuff from existing employees, and also when employee skill becomes a factor. So our philosophy is twofold. One, we prefer to hire people who don't have fabrication experience at all. We don't hire experienced press break operators. We don't hire experienced welders. We don't ex hire experienced laser operators. Our preference is to hire people that are uh, young and energetic, that have... Uh, a great work ethic, and that are ready and willing to learn. So that's the first piece. We open the employment pool a lot by just saying, we don't require you to have pre-existing fabrication experience. And then we train well, people in-house. How did you come to that realization from the very beginning? Because obviously you and your brother launched the shop, you ever, you know, and then you, 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 know, you, you started with people you know. Then how, how did you come to that realization? You know, I think it evolved for the most part we we learned how to do the job as we went and and then we built training material so that we could teach other people how to do the job and and with that kind of background that that uh, place where we came from it was just really easy to say well and to be clear if someone has fabrication experience it's not a strike against them it is actually a perk but it's not like a precondition we just realized, hey, we can bring anybody in, and we learned how to do it. We can teach them how to do it, and uh, and that works really well. Well, well, describe the process for me. How do you find these people? How do you interview them? And how do you onboard them? Well, we we will track down people. Right now, I mean, lately we've been hiring mostly people that people know, so it becomes a, a internal reference kind of thing, and we find that we have better luck with that. But in the past, we've advertised on job sites, just like everybody else does. In Utah, there's a KSL jobs website, um, and uh, and there's others that everybody's heard of. But yeah, we just, we use those, and then we'll uh, we'll look at resumes and kind of filter based on uh, the, the values that we have in the company, our core values. But at the end of the day, it's sometimes hard to predict how great a hire someone's going to be, which is why... Uh, it makes sense for us to hire people that people we already know are good fits. No, it happens. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. We've got, a, we've got a stellar employee, and all our employees are stellar. 
And if you've got a great employee and they're recommending someone and they're saying, yeah, they're, they're a great worker, they're smart, they're on the ball, that's enough for us. And at that point, it's just uh, just a question of getting them on board. So, you know, from that very beginning in 2017 and 18, um, how did you structure the organization to make sure everybody's rowing in the right direction? Because the, the issue with a lot of, you know, um, I've talked to a lot of our readers who, you know, who perhaps have jumped from shop to shop to shop because, well, they said, well, the ladder's not very tall. Uh, you can't, you know, cl- you know, there's only so many chiefs at a fab shop. And so that's, I just kind of jumped from shop to shop to shop. Uh, that's historically maybe changing. But uh, you kind of you kind of had the uh, the benefit of all right. You're starting with a blank slate. How are we going to grow this organization to uh, to give to to get the the best team possible and give them the best career possible? Well, the real question you have to ask is why are they moving around? Like, yeah, the ladder's only so tall, or there's only so many chiefs. Uh, but what what problem does that cause that forces them to move to a new place? Well, maybe they feel stagnant, and maybe that's a big part of it. They're hungry for more. But I think that the biggest piece of it is just that people have to make enough to live. And if they're not cutting it somewhere, they'll try to go somewhere else where maybe they can. And if the only way to make a living wage in a shop is to become a supervisor, then then yeah, you're basically guaranteeing that you're going to have high turnover while people hunt around just to figure out how to pay the bills. Uh, that's a real challenge in Utah. The living costs of, are super high here. Um, below only Hawaii and California. That wasn't always the case, but it is now. Um, And so we had this realization that if we want stellar people that are going to stick around for the long term, we just have to pay enough that they can actually live. And that means we actually pay way above the, the industry median for the equivalent work. But when we do advertise a job position, we have people effectively lined up down the block and we can pick a great hire. And uh, and we have almost zero uh, turnover. Uh, once we yeah. hire somebody, they tend to stick with us, and it's because our pay is great, and I think we've got a great atmosphere and environment as well for people. Right. Well, we'll get into that a- atmosphere and environment uh, because, you know, the, the, pay, the pay has to be great. That's step one. I mean, step one is, all right, you, you know, that you can't, uh, you need to have a competitive wage. But then, um, once they get there, what what's the environment that makes it a place where they want to stick around? I think our all our employees get along really well, and that sounds like such a simple thing, but it's not a salty kind of a workplace. You hear stories about shops where your supervisor is uh, is yelling at people, or people are stressed, and it's mass chaos all the time. And you know, we've got our share of stress here as well, but. When we have quality issues, we discuss them in front of the whole company, but we don't call out names. Um, we, uh, we're we not aggressive about blaming people for problems, or we, we're not a yelling kind of a culture. Um, it's just, it's a friendly kind of good place to work. And I think operationally as well, we've got great systems that provide a lot of clarity about what's going on all the time. Uh, what parts need to be made, where they are at, what happened here. And I think that reduction of confusion also lowers stress levels, which makes it an easier place to work as well. Right. The, actually, that that's a great point that you make because, again, we've talked in the past about your pipeline of work where once it's uploaded and once it's accepted by the system, it should flow through with little trouble. That's not 100%, but that's, that's what you're aiming for, right? And as long as you do have that, then the work environment becomes less stressful because you know exactly how things should flow when, ideally. There's always a little yeah. stress here and there, I'm sure. Um, but that also changes the day. Again, I've talked about this prior in the magazine where, you know, it's a diff- different kind of worker where the worker, there's one some workers who love the technical challenge of figuring something out on the job in front of them, where others like to be part of a streamlined process and a part of a team. I, I envision... Oshkot is like that, correct? As far as, far as all right, it's a collaborative environment where the, the the job is pretty much set once it hits the floor. Yeah. So there's the the nature of the work itself, uh, but there's also the nature of the different jobs on the floor. So we have a shipping department 
so where we do all our parcel shipping. And uh, anybody who's shipped metal knows it's one of the hardest challenges because uh, whatever shipping company, UPS, FedEx, you know, they're not exactly exercising care and they might throw a box around and damage a part. So in shipping, there are challenges to solve, which is how do I take this unique part I've never seen and package it in a way that it's not going to break. Then you've got freight, which has similar challenges. And you've got quality, uh, where they're looking at parts and making pass-fail decisions. This is the last quality step where it's actually getting moved from work in process to finished goods inventory. And then you've got deburring and finishing where we're operating a particular kind of machine that that fixes parts, but also the, the edge rolling brushes can pick them up and throw them. So they're having to deal with that challenge. Running the lasers is a totally different job. Running the press brakes is different from any of those as well. And what we found is that people gravitate to where they want to work and we provide the training for every single operation. Um, so so we've, we've got people who prefer to be in shipping because they like that. And then we've got people who prefer to run the brakes because there's something really satisfying about forming a blank on a press break and they like that. And then, of course, sometimes there's programming challenges too. So there's, there's a whole variety of things there. Or do you have what they what we like to call floaters with flow? They say, "All right, I like to be everywhere all at once," or 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 is it? Yeah, we've got they, people they who are like that. Right, yeah. right. They'll go wherever there's a bottleneck and it moves uh, day by day. Um, right. Actually, for us, it's almost always bending these days, but we're we're working on that. Right, right. So, 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 kind of bring me through, you know, how you identify these folks as far as where they will fit. Like, like you mentioned shipping. So, describe like the shipping. Like, all right, somebody who really loves shipping, what kind of person is that? Uh, our best people in shipping are real, just heads down, get to work, um, no drama kind of, I mean, I, I shouldn't say no drama, but um, we uh, they, they come to work on time, they ship a bunch of stuff, and they clock out on time. And they're just this steady, like super solid type. And they don't mind being in, in the weeds on shipping just constantly. Like they're not dragging their feet. And and I don't know, it's the kind of nature of the work. When I'm out on the floor, I actually prefer to be in shipping because there's just something really satisfying about seeing this giant pile of boxes grow, you know. And uh, well, and just describe kind of the, the your on the feet thinking there too, because you had to figure out how to put this odd looking part in a box, and you better make it right, otherwise all that value that was added upstream goes out the window. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if it gets damaged in shipping, we'll just re- replace it overnight replacements for a customer. It's pretty expensive, right? I mean, do, do, you, have- do you do do you have like a kind of a kind of a five uh, S cell or something to that effect where you have different components of shipping and packaging material to make it, all right, you know, choose this for this kind of part, this co- for this kind of part, or is that is it not that designated and process control? Just kind of bring me through that. There's maybe three or four different classes of shipping types that we end up using. Um, but for every parcel shipment that goes out, we're actually cutting boxes to size on demand. We've got a box coming cutting machine uh, that you you place all the parts how you want to put them in the box then you measure that you punch it in the machine it prints a box for you fold it up we always you know pack it tightly uh, for some classes of parts like long flat parts we'll have people um, we use this uh, uh, cardboard honeycomb to provide rigidity and additional protection and um, yeah so but every again every part's a little different every different kind of a challenge um you're also making decisions about how what parts to box together it might be a shipment that requires five parcels well what do we put together you know how many how big should the box be um do we want to put these little parts these little high density steel parts with the big sheet metal parts that could be damaged and yeah there's all kinds of questions like that i'm actually right. not the best at it so <laughs> but you do enjoy it. And it's a bit it's satisfying. But on the other side of that coin, you mentioned uh, in one of our previous conversations that you're actually uh, uh, you know, cross-training some folks on software development. 
and mm-hmm. some of them may have come from the floor. So that's kind of at the opposite end of the spectrum. So describe those experiences for me, where you identify folks in the floor, be they in front of the laser break, the burning, or wherever they happen to be, and say, "Wait a minute, this guy could actually learn some 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 fo- software fundamentals and, and help the software team out." Because because ob- in in your world, uh, the software development is key. Yeah, uh, we found that there's this perspective which is very incorrect, but there's kind of a attitude that says, hey, blue collar work is not smart work. It is so untrue. And we have so many smart people on the floor um, who are interested in learning new things. And for whatever reason, um, they got a job working for us and and we need you know, software developers. And here's a smart, uh, smart guy working uh, on the floor that's willing to to take that leap. So we have two people. We've got a, a, a development environment set up here in the office. And uh, when you know when there's peak times, they might be out on the shop floor. When there's lower demand times, they're actually working on software and they're actually integrated into our software team. This is fairly recent. We started doing this and we're doing all the training in-house and teaching them how to code. And it's actually working quite well. Really, really neat. And, and on the other side of that, I mean, you know, obviously your software team is the one area I assume that you, you, you need, they need experience. They need the previous coding experience, but then get, getting those people all from the floor to the office where they're coding and they're communicating with those experienced coders. Mm-hmm. Is there some kind of cross pollination there saying, well, this is what it's really like on the floor. Let's, let's, this is what we really need. Kind of, kind of, is there any kind of cross pollination happening there? Yeah, and it goes both ways. We get people off the floor into the software team meetings, working with that team. And obviously, when someone's was just out shipping something and they can comment on how the workflow can improve, that matters a lot. And then on the flip side, we also have software developers go out on the floor and actually do work, and they get a lot of ideas from that as well. Right. What's your opinion of you know there there's a there's a concern among a lot of shops I chat I chat with where um, and this is more prevalent albeit about five ten years ago when when uh, offline bend programming was was really coming into into the shop uh, they they fear button pushing they fear disengagement they fear hey people on the shop floor really need to know how to program a break. What's your th- take on that? Because you've you've never had a shop with with on the floor programming, correct? I mean, it was off offline from the get go. Um, it went you from your software stack right to right to the offline simulation, correct? Or or am I mistaken there? We so as far as the breaks go, we our pro our operators are the programmers. It is offline, but the pro, the computer's sitting there right next to the break. You know, we don't have. We, I, my perspective and our perspective is that it's really you learn a lot about a part when you program it, and if you're just handing off programs to an operator, your likelihood of bending wrong shoots through the roof. So it's better if the operator is the programmer, and that's true even if the programming is ninety percent automated, which it kind of is for us, um, because they they get to experience that you know maybe move the back ages around. Um, change the bend sequencing to make it a little easier. So right. we actually think that I actually agree with that. I think it's important that operators are also programmers. Now that's not true of the lasers. For a variety of reasons, it worked out to be way easier to have a single person handling the scheduling across our three different flatbed lasers. But we're working on new systems that will give operators the ability to dynamically change programs without having to involve someone in an office. The fullest extent of that is that maybe we now eventually we don't need somebody dedicated programming in the office. And if anybody that's currently doing that can do something else that's higher value. Right. So in other words, it would dynamically change on the fly and there would be no, I mean, I assume there would still be need for a check, right? As far as, all right, you're going to check this nest and say, all right, you know, they, I, I don't see any troubles there, no tip-ups, no distortion, because all the software took care of that, essentially. Yeah, and most ideally, but then you're going to, you asked, you're started to ask, well, why would an operator need to change a program? Well, um, we've never cut this nest before, and maybe there's a problem, uh, or maybe there was a little bit of scrap 
and uh, we need to cut some rework on a remainder or a remnant. Right. And uh, that's when the operator can get in and just fix it using right, right. first, you know, they're right at the machine expertise. Right, right. I find that interesting too, though. You know, and I could see. You know, I've been to a lot of shops with with. Uh, you know, they've they've got the the computer terminal right there on the floor, and usually it's the most experienced brake operator uh, uh, brake operator programming. And then they switch off, and that's how you, that's how you learn, and that's how you climb climb the ladder as far as. But you know, pro, you know, he he or she is programming offline to not tie up the machine, mm-hmm. and uh, and and you kind of have that egalitarian work. Re- regard you know regarding your your kind of structure of the shop is is there a department supervisor? I mean, do you, what what's your org chart look like? It's pretty flat. We have a shift lead and a GM, uh, and then the executive team, uh, but we don't have for the most part we don't have team leads uh, or anything like that. Uh, people tend every single one of our break operators programs. And sometimes we'll have this. This actually was happening the other day because bending such a big bottleneck. But we'll have four people on our two breaks, and two people are programming simultaneously, and two people are bending simultaneously, and there's some kind of trading around there. But, um, mm. but yeah, I mean, it's certainly true that some people are better at programming than others. But there's nothing like bending your own program that to teach you how to do it better. Right. 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 No, you know, honestly, back to kind of the the point that I think you were kind of getting at, which is, are we approaching a world where everybody's a button pusher? Um, and I I think you know maybe, but I mean we're a high mix shop, about as high mix as you can get. And I don't mean that in a in a, a bragging kind of a way, but um, you will do twenty five hundred unique part numbers every single week. Uh, we'll not see most of them ever again, and in that environment. Like there's just only so much you can automate. You've got to have right. a bunch of skilled people making decisions about what to do next and when to do tooling changeovers. And we're we're kind of resistant to the idea of trying to have software control all of that because there are just a million in edge cases that software will never be able to manage on its own. And I, I agree that's probably not a fun job pushing a button and watching a machine go, but um, for jobs where it does make sense to automate, there are cells that cut, denest, um, shuttle parts to a, a bending cell, get bent, and then and then stacked. You know the works, all the blanking and and forming. And you know if one operator can keep three of those going and is highly skilled, so when something happens, they can actually correct it. I, I can see that being pretty engaging because I mean, it takes it takes some real expertise to to figure out why. So, what if your operator is your programmer? Like, what's wrong with that? Right. Um, what if your operator is the one who knows how to get that machine going? And yeah, you'll pay him more, but hey, you combine those two jobs, uh, and now you know you you don't have just a mindless button pusher. You've got a skilled operator who can solve problems when they crop up. And there's also people who are just super hungry and engaged. And I, I say hungry as in they're just, they're eager to learn. They're eager to grow with the company. They really love the business element. Um, people that I could see taking leadership uh, roles uh, if and when we open a new shop or as we expand into other areas. Um, so yeah, yeah. We, you get all types for sure. And, uh, like I said, people tend to gravitate, but how do you find, like, if you want to find a particular type of person, uh, I don't know. I I think it's hard. Honestly, some people have said that there's a a lot you can do to try to suss out whether somebody's going to be a good worker, but you know, you might disqualify someone because you asked for a resume and they sent like something they threw together in WordPad on, on an old windows computer or something. And it looks horrible. It might be the best worker out there. You actually can't know. I think I, maybe you move the needle. Of, uh, maybe you're right. You know, sixty percent of the time instead of fifty-five percent of the time. Legitimately, that's what I think. I think it's more important that once you have someone on the team, you have great ways to close the loop with that person. And if they're not a fit, 
help them find a new place. And I don't mean that super euphemistic, euphemistically. I mean, if, if somebody's not a great fit, they're going to be happier somewhere else. And the team's going to be happier with someone else. Um, so I think the, the lesson is communicate issues early and often. And if somebody's not a culture fit, have the discipline to buckle down and do something about it so that the team that you land on ultimately is the best team. That's such a hard thing to do, but I think it's so important. And we haven't been perfect on it, um, but I can say that today we have the best team. I can't think of a single person in my 53-person company that isn't a fit. It's so great. And it's and we had to make some hard choices to, to end up in that place. Yeah, and as, as many shop managers and longtime leaders in this business have, have told me over the years, uh, building a team uh, to make sure everyone is, is a good fit and is in the right seat on the bus, so to speak, uh, really helps serve as a kind of a launch pad of opportunity, uh, which I think if, if you really think about it, it's what launching a business, any business is all about. Uh, and it's been a common theme at some of the most progressive fab shops out there. Um, so with that, thank you for joining us uh, for this episode of the Next Gen Middle Fab podcast. Uh, Fab Tech is upon us soon, coming up in October in Orlando. Uh, busy time for us all and an opportunity to get various new voices and new perspectives uh, from the next generation of industry leaders. Uh, so be sure to stay tuned for that. Uh, with that, thanks to all for joining us for the Next Gen Metal Fab podcast, and we'll see you next time. The Next Gen Metal Fab podcast is a production of Fabricators and Manufacturers Association and part of the FMA Podcast Network. The show is hosted by Tim Heston and Caleb Chamberlain. The podcast is produced and edited by Garrett Slager and Dana Weicker. Additional production support by Dan Davis, Andy Flando, Mike Owens, Billy Culpa, Elizabeth Gavin, and me, Sarah Spring. Thank you for listening. <laughs>